So what I would like to cover today, um, we'll try to run through a lot of material in the short period of time that was um, laid out. I'll try to keep us on time in terms of the breaks, but if I do have to stretch things, um, just to, to give you fair warning that we're going to try to cover quite a bit here. So today I'm going to run through just a basic background and introduction to glass in buildings, um, both from a manufacturing standpoint for glass, which then gets into why and how glass fails. We'll run through how glass strength is determined, um, an explicit approach as well as a stochastic approach, so explicitly actually calculating glass strength um, and then just looking briefly at glass strength per various codes where it comes from from a testing standpoint. I'm going to do a fairly, hopefully a fair, fairly thorough code overview, both the requirements of the 2012 IBC as well as additional um, codes that govern glass design, um, and in addition to that, go over some general glass design guidelines. So much of the material um, for this presentation has come from, there was a, a group, the European Cooperation in Science and Technology, a cost action group um, that came together uh, a number of years ago to more thoroughly research glass and glass in structural applications and, you know, start to work on more thorough Euro code, produce a glass textbook, um, produce presentations and materials such as these ones um, to help educate both design professionals and academics. So I have to thank the cost action group. That, that group is now closed, but a lot of the folks that were involved in that group, a lot of the researchers um, and professors are obviously still doing glass research and other work, and I do owe them some credit for this presentation. Um, so background in terms of glass and the evolution of glass in buildings and in building structures. Many years ago, glass, you know, was, was only commercially available or readily available in small panes. Um, throughout the years, we've seen a, a movement towards more transparency in design. Um, lots of glass in curtain wall applications on buildings, really allowing users and occupants of a building to feel um, a, a bit less disconnected from the outside world. Um, and with that evolution and transparency, we start to see more and more structures that actually use glass in structural applications or what would be seen as more structural applications than simply a window pane. Um, and here are just a few examples of what we can do with glass structures. Um, as Professor Ghosh mentioned, we see glass in structural applications far more frequently in Europe and in Asia, I think, than we do here in the United States. Um, this is a medical school in Glasgow. Uh, we have glass beams um, at this skylight, and then the actual glass panes of the roof. There aren't any mullions there. Everything supports structural loads. This is an example of a glass stair, and this is an um, application that we actually see fairly, I don't want to say incredibly frequently in Europe, but it's happening more and more frequently. Uh, Apple stores have made these um, fairly popular. Here, the stringer of the stair is this very deep glass beam that also serves as the handrail. And this is the exterior, the entry to the Apple store in Shanghai. Um, and this, I think, is a, is a fascinating glass structure because it uses effectively every element of, of glass you could use in a structural application. We have these very large curved glass panes for the walls. We have glass columns. We have glass beams at the roof and flat panes for the roof structure. And then as you enter into that store, um, uh, there's a spiraling staircase also made of glass. Apple stores really have been iconic in terms of pushing, um, pushing glass in structural applications, be making them uh, far more visible to the general public. So, background on glass. Um, there are a few types of naturally occurring glass. Um, obsidian and moldavite both come from volcanic, um, or they can be found around volcanoes, areas where the, the earth is naturally kind of heating up the various elements that would make up glass. And then fulgurite um, is a type of glass that, uh, that occurs when a, an asteroid or a meteor um, hits the earth and heats up sand very suddenly. Um, what is glass from a chemical standpoint? Um, it's a crystalline structure. Um, so here, quartz, we see silicone, uh, silicone and oxygen. Um, silica glass is more of an amorphous structure, and then sodalime silica glass, which is what we often use in building applications. Um, it's the same thing as silica glass, but you have sodium elements introduced to reduce the melting temperature of glass, allowing it to be more workable, um, and you can actually make sheets of it. 
mechanical behavior of glass. Glass, uh, I think, as we all know, and part of the fascinating part of glass in a structural application is glass is a very brittle material. And this is really what makes glass stand out from most, uh, almost every other material that we regularly use as structural engineers. Um, once glass breaks, it's broken. And it breaks very suddenly, and it usually breaks completely. Um, as such, glass is, by some, uh, by some standards, could be considered not a safe building material. Um, and I'm, I'm going to put that statement out there, and it's something that we need to keep in mind um, as we think about glass design. Um, once, we, once we hit fracture and once glass fails, there's, there's not any residual strength left. And so that's something that really underlies design is how do we, how do we deal with that fact so that we can have practical structures that can actually be safe 